just to show you that the Holy Spirit is real, I prayed about what books I should bring based upon what conversations I'm going to have a talk about today. And this is, this, this is one of the books that I felt God say to bring today. That's for you. Using the Syriac substrate, the virgins become raisins. And it's a big difference whether a martyr is going to get seven virgins to shag eternally or seven raisins to eat. Because that's what Muhammad said, didn't he? He said, how could I see Allah when he is veiled in light? That means that light, something that Allah creates, is sufficient to veil Allah. One of his creations is greater than him to veil him. Jesus has just said that the honor you give to God, give to me. Venerate me like you venerate God. That's what he said, not follow. Mr. Brown, and to any Muslims who watch this, you have to stop listening to the Dawah team because the Dawah team are lying to you about Christianity. Any bilingual human being is better than Allah because Allah can't communicate in English. So I want to talk about the Dawah team. I know there's a lot of new people here in the park. So let, just let me explain how the park works. You've got teams of Christians that come down here and spread the Christian faith. Look up DCCI and SoCo Films. And you have teams of Muslims who come down here and they spread the Islamic faith. No, we Christians call the Muslims the Dawah team. And I want to address all the acolytes of the Dawah team that I know will watch this video when they see the words Dawah team on the video. Please do share it with Shamsi. Please do share it with Hijab. Please do share it with Allah Needs Dawah, Shamsi Gonthalus, Muhammad the Golden Shower, or any of the other Hashim, I don't know my trinity, or Mansua, he's not the Gollum, he's a Gelfling. The fact of the matter is, the Dawah team run from the Christians week in, week out. They only ever want to debate tourists, students, Christians who are here and don't know any apologetics or who have never studied their faith in any depth. We have them on video again and again and again and again and again and again and again running from us when we challenge them to debate about their religion. They feel free to criticize the Christian faith, but they don't want to hear criticisms of Islam. Well, I say, if they criticize Christianity, we are going to criticize Islam. And if you can't defend your religion, then you need to maybe think about whether your religion is true. If your ideas and your values cannot stand up to scrutiny and criticism, perhaps it should suggest to you that your ideas are not as good as you think they are. The fact that the Dawa team have fled from the debate shows that the Christians have beaten them intellectually in the park. So all of you trolls who keep putting in the comment section of SoCo Films, why don't you debate this person or this person or this person? I do and they run away. It happened just two weeks ago with Adnan Rashid. He ran, he ducked for cover. Why? Because he was lying about the Christian faith and I was going to call him out on the lie and so he ran. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, the Dawah team are lying to Muslims about Christianity. You need to study the Christian faith with a knowledgeable Christian. Don't believe the lies that your friends tell you. Don't believe the lies that the media tells you. Don't believe the lies of your scholars. 
study with knowledgeable Christians what Christianity teaches, and I bet it's not what you think they teach. So bring your Dawa champion, and I'll debate him. What's your name, sir? What is your name, sir? Bob. What's your real name? What's your full real name? My surname is Brown. And your full real name? He doesn't know his full real name. Notice, he's saying give your full real name. He doesn't want to do it himself. This is a man who comes in the park and regularly tries to whip up people as Islamophobes. He does it multiple times. He's a Christophobe. He's an agitator. So, let's debate Islam. I have a question for you. Do you want to debate Islam? Oh, he doesn't want to debate Islam. He doesn't want to debate Islam. I'm not an expert in the Quran or Hadith, yeah? If you want to bring anything from the Quran or Hadith, I'm not an expert. I have this time. Are you an expert about whether the sun sets in a puddle of mud or not? I'm still a, I'm still a student. Simple question. I'm not going to rely on you being an expert of the Quran. I'm just going to rely on you being an expert. description of a... A place, right? What does it say? Description of a Tell everybody place. what it really yeah. says, because I'm just going to read it if you don't. Got a description of another place. What's what what's it going to say? Right, you believe, Notice he's not it. quoting the verse properly. Wait, Go on, tell everybody and then I'll you correct believe, you. You believe that the Garden of Eden is on Earth, right? That's what you believe, right? The Garden of Eden is on Earth and there's two cherubims, yeah? A cherubim is a naked baby angel, by the way, yeah? There are two types of angels in the Bible. Yeah, there's a regular angel, what everybody's known to, accustomed to, and there's a thing called cherubim. And a cherubim are naked, little naked baby angels. And they believe in the Garden of Eden, which is on earth, right? There's two cherubims guarding each gate with a flaming sword there. I looked on Google Earth. I've been looking and looking on Google Earth to find this flaming sword. But you know what? To this day, I still haven't found it. My guy, tell me. Where is, where, is, where is the Garden of Eden? So... It says in your Bible, it's on earth. Now, where is it? please know, I, I allowed him to speak. I allowed him to speak without interruption. I allowed him to speak without interruption. Now let's see if he can provide me the same courtesy that I provided to him. He said that we Christians believe in the cherubim and that the cherubim are little baby angels. This just shows the utter ignorance of the man who's speaking. Is it true or false? He's no, it's false. Ah. The word in, angel. In painting, notice he doesn't painting, give me the courtesy that he expects. Medi yeah. exactly. He's taking his information from medieval paintings, not from the Bible. We Christians don't form our doctrine from medieval paintings. The medieval paintings are just representations. Well, the word has. angel baby means baby. messenger. But notice how the fake Mr. Brown got off the topic that I actually asked him about, which is what the Quran says. Because this is what the Quran says. Until he reached the setting place of the sun. Everybody say setting place of the sun. Set it so Mr. Brown can hear you. Setting place of the sun. We already had this debate. What's the point? He found it setting in a spring of black muddy water. Everybody say he found it setting in a spring of black muddy water. In a spring of muddy water. So the Quran says that the sun sets in a spring of black muddy water. You don't need to be an expert of the Arabic because it is translated by two experts who are linguistics already. The work has been done for you. The question is, do you believe that the sun sets in a spring of muddy water? Of course. I will not interrupt you like you interrupted me.
the thing is, when he when the, when he's reading that verse, right, he doesn't understand it in the language of the Quran. Now, in the language of the Quran, he's telling you a description of a place. He doesn't say it's actually the sun sets in muddy water. He's telling you of a description. He does not. He's, he's speaking it in in the English tongue where you understand it literally. Now, if you read it in the Arabic, he's telling you. In the Arabic, it's actually a description of a place, of a king that went in one place where he saw a sun set in a certain way. Then he went to another di uh, direction where he saw a sun in a certain, in a different way. And if you go to Spain, you could go to Spain, I've been to Spain, you could go even to uh, Portugal, you can see the sun from the far, it looks like it's setting in the spring water, right? But it's just a description. Now, if you're in here in London, and if you look at the sun, say it doesn't set the same way as it sets in Spain or in China or wherever, right? But then I, I'm asking him, I'm asking him. He believes in Genesis, right? They believe, yeah, the Garden of Eden is on Earth, right? And there's, a, there's two cherubims, and the ancient Christians at the time described cherubims as little baby angels, right? They believe there's two angels guarding the gates of Garden of Eden, and there's a sword that's flaming, that's a flaming sword there. Now I'm asking the question, where is it? Okay. I've looked all over Google Earth and I can't May I reply? It. Now please notice, I did not interrupt him. Let's see if he can give me the same courtesy that I have given to him. He did it the first time, let's see if he can do it the second time. He says that the Quran is giving a description of a place. Uh, how is that even possible? Yeah. Where's the logic in it? There's no logic in it. You're here for something, but you're destroying something else. The, the, what's just happened behind the camera, and we, we just witnessed it, is members of the BLM, there's a group here, radical feminists, that are talking about trans women and real women. And the group from the BLM have literally just vandalized their property and stole their sign. And they're, they're clapping and cheering. And they're clapping and cheering. The thing is, this tells you why you have to oppose the Marxists. They are not interested in a rational debate. They don't have any rational demands. They are vandals and criminals, and you have to stand up to them. Because these vandals and criminals will do nothing but cause harm to our society. BLM has no right to be in the UK. In the UK, there's no officers with guns killing innocent minorities, yeah? Bottom line, they have no right to be here marching for nothing. You want to march, go to the states where you think there's a problem. But these people follow a narrative like horses, yeah? They've got these little blinders on, they all see is one tunnel, yeah? But they don't see the fact that these officers, they're all crooked all over the world. It's not just in the states. The state, in the states, the officers, they don't just target black people. There is no, there is no law in the states where it directly um, are marginalised or discriminates against a minority. There ain't none. You ain't gonna find a law, yeah. But they say otherwise, yeah. But what? BLM. There's no, there's no need for you to be here. We don't okay. have those things here. You want to march? Go march in the states. Yeah. It's but about. You think that there's some sort It's of about discussion. truth. And exactly. the fact is, the BLM don't care about truth. No, they what they care about is whipping up a sense of injustice, yes. real and imagined. Yes. Now, there are real injustices to be dealt with, and they do talk about them, but they despoil their own agenda by talking about imaginary injustices as well. And if you're an ideology that is willing to commit injustices to fight your injustices, then you're going to turn everyone against you. Bottom line. Fact of the matter is, I won't get in bed with a Marxist organization because Marxists are as bad as Nazis. They killed a hundred million people. Now, the African American, one last thing. In, in, the, in the States, the African American are a minority. They're 16%, right? But this 16% is responsible for 52% of murder that happens in the US. Why? Why doesn't this 16%, yeah? If, if there was racism in the States, people like Kanye West would not become a millionaire or a billionaire. That, that is how it works. And you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear the truth. And that's the bottom line. And BLM is funded by one person, George Soros. Ben. The same, same person who's funding Antifa. 
Uh, Jesse, you're going to have to stay close to your camera. These people are clearly no, demonstrating that no, they're not. Uh, rich black you got to stay close to the camera with these guys. Why you got to stay close to the camera with these guys. Yeah. Uh, back to our, our anyway, debate. so back to our debate. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> for once, me and Mr. Brown are both united. <laughs> so, because it's about truth. Truth matters. That's the thing. Truth matters. Not your sense of grievance, not your emotions. Truth matters. Well, that's testable. So this is what we were talking about. Allow me to reply to him. Mr. Brown needs to be educated about Christianity. The canon of our faith is not in our art. Yes, there is Christian's art that portrays the cherubim as babies. Why? Because it is portraying the innocence of the cherubim. It is portraying the purity of the cherubim. They are pure like a newborn child. They are innocent like a newborn child. That is the iconography of the cherubim when they are portrayed as babies. It is not a literal statement that we Christians really believe that the cherubim are actually newborn babies. Now, he talked about, I have searched everywhere looking for the Garden of Eden. He doesn't need to search everywhere if he actually reads the scriptures carefully. Because the scriptures talk about rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden. All he needs to do is identify the rivers and follow them. And that's the area he needs to search. But that tells us something. It tells us that Mr. Brown is using hyperbole and he's not done any search at all. Because he didn't bother to do simple reasoning. Now, I as a Christian, much to the upset of some of my brothers and sisters, don't believe Genesis is a literal account. I don't believe that there is literally a garden somewhere on earth or that there was literally an Adam and an Eve. This story is a midrash, a poetry, a metaphor to communicate truths about God, about man, about the world and about the cosmos. And I believe in Genesis completely on those truths it communicates. However, the Quran has made a statement, a testable statement, a verifiable statement, and it didn't give it as a description as Mr. Brown suggests. I'll read the words as translated by Muslim linguists, scholars from Medina University in Saudi Arabia, not an illiterate in speaker's corner here or here connected to the Arabic language. And the linguists, the scholars, the Muslims translate the Arabic into the English as follows. Until when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black muddy water. That is not a description of a place, it is a description of what happens to the sun, where the sun sets, to make his matters worse. There are reports in other Islamic literature that talk about an account of Muhammad riding with one of his companions on a donkey. And Muhammad says to one of his companions, oh, I think it's, I can't remember the name, oh, so-and-so, do you know where this sun sets? And the companion says, oh, by Allah, I know not, but you, O Muhammad, know better than I. And Muhammad replies that the sun sets in a pool of muddy water. So the Quran says, that the sun sets in a pool of muddy water and Muhammad in another discussion with one of his companions says exactly the same. When the evidence stacks up, the conclusion is obvious. Muhammad genuinely believed that the sun sets in a pool of muddy water. Why? Because he was not a prophet from God. He didn't have a line to God. God was not speaking to him and he was an ignorant Bedouin. 
who was conning the local Arabs. And that is just one evidence that I'm about to give you. In my next talk, I'll give you another. Over to you, Mr. Brown, the non-expert on Islam. And he's, an, he's an expert on, on Islam and the Hadiths and, and the Quran because he studied uh, for many, many years with all the top elites, yeah, of the, of the elites, yeah? Okay, right. You said you don't take the, the, the Genesis verse. Could you uh, just repeat what you said about the Genesis? You don't take that as a whole literally. I don't take the Genesis story of Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2 as literal. So is, what is it? Is it apocryphal or...? No, it, it's a metaphorical story. So, it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's like, um, you know what Jesus tells parables? Uh, I get parables. So when Jesus tells a parable, no one says, oh, Jesus has told a parable. He's talking about something that really happened. Well, Genesis 1 and 2 is like a parable. It's communicating deep, profound, important spiritual truths that I believe in, but it's not talking about history as a literal event. Okay, so when he says... Um, they heard God walking and they hid behind the... That's, that's a parable So what is that communicating? It's communicating that the first man was in a state of innocence before his Lord and had a relationship with his Lord. That his Lord, his Lord communicated with him directly, which is very different from what Islam says, because Islam doesn't believe that Adam and Eve, that God and man, communicate with one another directly because that would mean that Allah has entered into his creation. He has to go by an intermediary, an angel. But wait, uh, so I just want to get this uh, straight, yeah? So you don't believe in the thingy, uh, but uh, so the person that came, so it wasn't really a person who came into the Garden of Eden. It's a fair question. Do you know what Adam means in Hebrew? beginning or something? It means mankind. Okay. That's what it means. And if you read Genesis carefully, it says in Genesis chapter 1 that on the sixth day, God created man, male and female, he created them. And then if you read Genesis carefully, Adam and Eve have children and those children who are male find wives. So the reality is, if you take Genesis literally, you're going to run into problems. And I don't do that. So Genesis is not literal? It's not literal, but it is true. Because the truth that it is communicating, the truth that it is communicating is the truth of God's relationship with man, the fact that God is the creator, the fact that God is the only God, the fact that there is only one God, the fact that God is far, that, that God has a Holy Spirit, the fact that God's Spirit gives us life, the fact that obedience to God in that innocent state before the fall is the, the life source of man and that the absence of that leaves man to die, leads man into that spiritual death. Because remember, God said, if you eat of the fruit, surely you shall die. And then Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, but they didn't die. They lived for hundreds of years, according to the story of Genesis. How many Christians actually believe that? Lots of Christians. Yes, yeah, some Christians do. And I've got no dispute with those Christians. Here's a, here's a question. Do you take uh, Genesis literally or figuratively? What do you mean? Uh, is Genesis the story of Genesis? Are you a Christian? Take it literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah, well, but the... Bob doesn't take it literally. And what's your point? There are two Christians that take it literally. There are two Christians that don't take it literally. Christians... I'll so, ask this question then. So, right, go on, ask your question. So the God that appeared to Adam and Eve, right? So was that, which one of the Trinity was that? So the God that mankind was interacting with is the Logos. Because, the, no, the Logos is the Son. All of the interactions through the Old Testament with God are the Logos. The New Testament is clear. No one has seen God at any time except the Son and to whom the Son reveals him. Jesus Christ said himself, he who has seen me has seen the Father. The Apostle Paul is clear. He, referring to Jesus, is the exact image of God. It is Christ who is the icon that reveals God the Father to us and has always revealed God the Father to us. That's what Christians believe. Now, Mr. Brown, at this moment, at this moment, I think this is an educational moment and you're listening. You're engaging, genuinely. Which I like. I prefer this. That's fine. I like this kind of... Yeah, me too. So, 
So, so let me, I'm trying to understand this. So, so when you say, that, is the son the father? No, Christians don't believe the son is the father. So then how, then, so how can you say that the, the son is God? So that's a really good question. It's a really easy question to answer. So we believe as Christians that the thing that is divine, that, that thing, whatever we call it, whatever it is, that, that is, that is, that is the, the divinity, the Father has it completely, the Son has it completely, and the Holy Spirit has it completely. It's not divided between them. Each one of them has it wholly and completely simultaneously at the same time. Without division, without partner, there's no one else that has it, only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they have had it since before time began. There's never a point at which they had it, and there's never a point at which they don't have it. But then how do you, how do you balance, like, um, so you're telling me now that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost yes. are same, yeah? They have the same, we call it the oasis, okay. or the substance. Okay, Trinity. Yeah. Okay, so, so how, do you, how do you balance it out when, when the Son was on Earth, in the, uh, in, in the story of Gethsemane, he's, the, he's there praying, to the Father, how do you... Okay, let me, let me... Yeah, another, go on. Another, yep, yep. There's another uh, uh, time as well where he's praying to the Father as well, when he's supposedly on the cross. Yeah. And he's, he's praying to the Father. So how do you... That's a fair question, let me answer it. They, yeah. They're meant to be the same. Yeah, no, 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 you, no. So let me, let me be clear. Let me be clear, because you're asking a, a fair question. I think you're asking it sincerely. Though, to be fair, this is a question that I know you've heard before. I know you've repeated it before. And I know you've heard the answer before. However, at this moment, I think you're genuinely engaging, so let me answer it again. I, I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. I've heard it from other Christians, but for me, it seems like you are separate from regular Christians. You are something different. So, you, 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 the, 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 I'm, 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 I, there's many, many, many Christians. So let me, let me, let me answer the question. Let me answer the question. Because Muslims again and again and again and again and again attack the Trinity whilst ignoring the doctrine of the Incarnation. Christians believe in the Trinity and we also believe in the Incarnation. We believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that these three are not the same persons. So the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. And they have all, yes, exactly. And they have always existed like this before time. They never came into existence in this way. No one shares in this existence. It is uniquely theirs that they share in the one being completely simultaneously and without division. Now, we also believe in the Incarnation, that the Son of this Trinity took upon Himself a human nature. Now, when the Son, who was communicating with the Father, one second, who was communicating with the Father before time began, when He becomes man, He's not going to become an atheist. He's not going to stop talking to His Father. So he continues to speak to his father, but as a human being, he is now doing it. And so we see him pray to the father and worship the father because he is a human being and all human beings must worship the father. It's very simple questions, really. No, no, let, let, let the brother speak. Where, no, where are we now? Engaging. So, uh, what you said, so the father took on a form of the son. I did not say that. Okay. So what was I'll say it again. Yeah. Because you weren't listening. I was, I was. But Pay you, attention. You, you, Pay attention. You for so long and I, okay, just I'll points. summarize what, one, one quick point. We Christians have believed and always believe that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Always, at all times. And the Son becomes flesh. He joins flesh to himself. The Son, not the Father. So, when you say the Son took on flesh, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely asking, so don't go onto, onto a tantrum what I'm about to say, yeah? Yeah, you, 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 that's fair enough. Isn't that modalism or sephalinism? No. Because you're saying that the, the son existed, how he existed, the form up there, yep. when he was with the father. Yep. When he came to earth, he took the form of that human flesh. So isn't that sephalinism? Because he took the form. Allow me to answer that question. Allow me, I get the question. Allow me to answer it. I just want to extend it a little okay. bit so yeah, we get yeah, the yeah, picture. Yeah. So, but then when he goes back, is, is it the same form that's going back? And when he's returning, is it going to be the same form again? Okay, so let me answer that question. Because I know that you've picked that up from the Dawah team. I want to tell you, Mr. Brown, that Muhammad Hijab is lying to you. Ali Dawah is lying to you. Hashim is lying to you. Listen to me. Like Listen to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, your question tells me 
that you're getting your information from them. Let me explain why. Modalism and Sibelianism. Okay, let's move away from the uncle. So, okay, so modalism and Sibelianism came around the end of the second century and the beginning of the third century, okay? We know where these writers were, we know who they were, we know what they taught. However, Christian writings demonstrate a belief in the Trinity as far back as the first century, outside of the New Testament. It's Trinitarian in form and conduct and worship. Let me give you an example. Am I all right to give you an example? Yeah. So the point of the, right, if you believe, if you believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all the same person as the Sibelians do, as the modalists do, then your worship is to the Father, yeah? However, I'm going to demonstrate to you that as early as the mid-second century, as early as the mid-second century, in fact, I'll go even earlier than that, I'll do it in the Didache. The Didache is Trinitarian. So I'm quoting now from the Didache. Didache. The Didache, yes. The Didache was the earliest document outside of the New Testament. What year was it? What century was it? Between the, the, the estimates are between 90 AD and 130 AD. So it's very early. No one disputes that. That is not a controversial statement. As you know, Christians baptize. You know that. I'm sure you do. And I'm sure everyone who's listening to me knows that. We baptize. That is an act of worship. An act of worship. And we direct that act of worship to who? We direct it, as it says in the Digrike, the procedure for baptizing is as follows. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Who is the Father? The Father is God. Who is the Son? Jesus Christ, who is the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit ain't the Son and he ain't the Father because if they were all the same person, you would just baptize in the name of Jesus like oneness Pentecostals do. They are modalists and they don't baptize in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit because they understand that that's Trinitarian. When they baptize, they baptize only in the name of Jesus. Wasn't Jesus baptized as well? Yes, by John. By John. So. Here we have, I'm not trying to be funny here. Yeah, 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 go ahead. So why would God need to be baptized by a human who has sin? Because was, John was born with sin, right? Yes, yes. So why would uh, God need to be baptized by a sinner? And that was exactly the question that John asked. Yeah. When the Lamb of God came before John the Baptist, he said, and Jesus said, I need to be baptized by you. John said, how can I baptize you? Surely, surely, you need to baptize me. And Jesus said, do this so that all might be fulfilled. What is he talking about? He's talking about the new covenant. Because when a Jew entered into Judaism, if a proselyte became a Jew, after they'd received the snip, the man, the woman, and all the children were baptized. It was part of the initiation rite into the new covenant. So Jesus who is establishing a new covenant, yeah? He is establishing a new covenant of repentance that leads into the kingdom of God. He is baptized because he is baptized for us. When he is baptized, his baptism is the baptism that we receive when we are baptized. But Jesus didn't have original sin, did he? No, he didn't have original sin. No one's saying that he did. John's baptism wasn't connected to the idea of original sin. John's baptism was connected on the idea of preparing the way of the Messiah. He was establishing a community in preparation for the new Messiah. I'm sorry, we're, we're engaging. Go on. Paul, Paul says that we're a body. He describes us as the body of Christ. So when Christ is baptized, that baptism is what we enter into when we are baptized. Really has to be baptized. 
يعني السنة What, what, what was the baptism of John? Well, the, John was doing the, the, the office of Elijah. He was reconciling mothers and daughters and fathers and sons to level all the hills and to raise up all the valleys in preparation for the Messiah. He was baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. He was baptizing the repentant who were the expectant for the coming kingdom of God. And who hails the kingdom of God? Who brings the kingdom of God? Who makes the kingdom of God real? Jesus Christ in his incarnation. So he is baptized by John because he is the one that owns this baptism. That's what the whole point of John's baptism was about, was to prepare the way of the Messiah. So the Messiah is baptized to own it. And through Christ, that baptism is what we receive. It's because we believe that God operates through sacraments, through covenants. This concept is alien to you because Islam doesn't have that idea. But I'm not inviting you to something like Islam. I'm inviting you to something better than Islam. I, I, I get the concept, but what I don't get is why God, in his infinite wisdom, needs to be, come here and be baptized by a human being who has sin. In, why not? Anyway, I think we can go into a long one. I, I just want to... Um... Oh, wait, before you do that then, because, believe it or not, guys, just to show you that the Holy Spirit is real, I prayed about what books I should bring based upon what conversations I'm going to have a talk about today. And this is, this, this is one of the books that I felt God say to bring today. That's for you. Clearly that was for you. It's a gift, yes, it's yours. You're asking questions about baptism. I felt God tell me to bring this book. He said that I would be talking to someone about baptism today. There you go. Because our God speaks, your God does not. You don't need to add the extra insults, but I mean, it's, it's fine when you said our oh, God speaks, but then when you say your God doesn't, it's just extra insults. But is it an insult or a fact? Not, no, it's what you believe. Does Allah... It's what you believe, perceive, okay. that God speaks. Wait, wait does Allah speak directly to any human being? Not the, not the way that you're thinking. Right, but he, he speaks through intermediaries, doesn't he? Intermediaries, right. sometimes... Prophets, he, angels... Yeah, so the fact of the matter is, Allah never speaks. It's not Allah speaking. Yeah, but that's our God speaking through dreams, not Allah speaking through dreams. Yeah, they are, but that's not, that's not in the book Islam. That's not the Islam that Muhammad, that's folk Islam. It's kind of like the superstitious Christianity that many Christians follow. You know, this idea that if your children's not baptized, he's possessed by the devil. That is a, a superstition of Christians. It is a superstition of folk Islam that Allah can speak to you through a dream. Because if Allah is speaking to you through a dream, why are you not a prophet? Muslims believe that Allah never speaks to them, except via an intermediary, a prophet or an angel. But that means that no one has ever heard Allah. No one has ever seen Allah. So how do we know that Allah is God? None of the prophets can testify to seeing Allah like Moses did, like Jesus did. None of them. Uh, Muhammad said, how could I see Allah when he is veiled in light? Now, despite the fact that that means that light is concealing Allah, there's something greater than Allah that conceals him. Perfect. Because that's what Muhammad said, didn't he? He said, how could I see Allah when he is veiled in light? That means that light, something that Allah creates, is sufficient to veil Allah. One of his creations is greater than him to veil him. Have you thought about that? Uh, I've thought about many stuff, uh, like... Um, uh, like the Bible says, no man can see God and live. So we have the same concept. We can't see God and live. We can't hear his uh, voice and live. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, make, make, it doesn't make sense to even uh, go into that. Sort of thing. So go on, bro. Go on, Mr. Brown. Then we're going to go into a different thing. We can 
but um, just, the, just the last thing, just um, the last thing, it's just a little misconception, maybe you could clarify it, it's genuine, it's Trinity again, because Trinity concept is very, for some Christians like yourself it's easy to understand, for some it's very hard to grasp, they can't grasp the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, yes, yeah, the yeah. point of the Trinity, so like, um, so in the Trinity, um, how many gods are there in the Trinity, and um, can you show me in Jesus' own words where he says, I am the Father in, uh, in I am the Father and the Spirit. Worship me, not not not, uh, not you know other people's work. In his own work. That's fine. He's asked a fair question. He deserves a fair answer. That's fine. Okay. So, Mr. Brown, and to any Muslims who watch this, you have to stop listening to the Dawah team, because the Dawah team are lying to you about Christianity. We Christians are very clear. We believe in one God. It's also true what Mr. Brown says, lots of Christians can't explain the Trinity. And I beg Christians who come to the park, stop trying to explain something if you don't understand it. Have the humility to say that I don't have the ability to explain it. There's no shame in admitting what you can't explain. Leave it, leave it to those, leave it to those who can. Now, Christians, are you listening? Utterly, completely, and with absolute conviction, believe only in one God, not more gods, not less gods. When we say that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are God, we're saying that they are the same divinity, that they are the same divine, not three different divinities, not three different gods. Now you ask me, where does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? So I'm going to give you that, okay? Now, do you have a Bible, Mr. Brown? Not on you. Do you have one at home? Yes. Okay. So I want you to listen to these words. Now, you know enough about the New Testament to know that when it says Father, it's referring to God, right? Yes? Yes. So when it says Father, it's referring to God. Listen to what Jesus said. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Father, sorry, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Now let's just put Allah in there so that you get the full weight of what Jesus is saying. Because we know the Father is referring to God, and we know that we can refer to God as Allah. For not even Allah judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor Allah. Now let me ex ask you this question. You've asked me multiple questions, I want to ask you one. Jesus says, honor him as you honor Allah. Will you do that? Uh, can I explain this first? Because I understand what you just read there, I understand it differently from the way you understand it. So long as you answer my question. I'm going to answer it. Yeah. So, when he, when he says honor, uh, honor the Father, uh, what does it say? Sorry, read it again. It says, honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So, as I understand it, from coming from an Eastern perspective, he's saying, follow the prophets at that time, whether it be Jesus or Moses, or any other prophets, follow them at that time. If you honor their, whatever they're preaching to you, honor them. If you honor that preaching, whatever they're preaching, you honor the Father. So, that's the way I understand right. it. So when Jesus says, honor, if you honor the Father, if you honor me, you're honoring the Father. So it's meaning, for me, I understand it is, if you follow what I say, you're following the Father. No, listen, no, that, I, I want you to, I want to ask you, I want to, Mr. Brown, I want you to answer this question. I'm trying to get it in the Eastern Right? Sort of yeah, 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 yeah. But, but you're not the only one with the access to Eastern philosophy. Just so we all know, there are tens of millions of Eastern Christians that understand this verse in the way I understand it. So claiming the title Eastern Understanding says nothing for this debate. So, Jesus said, honor him as you honor the Father. How do you honor God? Why would Jesus say that? No, 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 Mr. Brown, you're not answering, your, I've answered your questions. I want you to answer some of mine now. Answer my question, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, the question is, will you, ha firstly answer this question, how do you honor Allah? By following his prophets. By following his prophets and what else? 
worship him alone. Worship him alone. Think about him. Brilliant. Great. Great. Listen. He gave two criteria to honor God. Follow his prophets and worship him alone. Now Jesus said, honor the son as you honor the father, which means follow the prophets sent by the son and worship the son alone. Will you do that? It doesn't say that in the Bible. Will you answer the question? Will you worship Jesus like he instructs you to? But it doesn't say that. Why not? Because it doesn't say that. It says honor the Father. No, it doesn't say that. So honor Read it. Me as you would honor the Father. Exactly. Yeah. So, no. so how would you honor God again? I understand that that verse. I understand is Jesus saying, "Follow me." Yeah. If you follow me, I will lead you to the Father. No. What does it say? It doesn't say follow. It says honor. Honor. Yeah. You're changing the word. What does honor mean? Honor doesn't mean worship. What does honor mean? Honor means just. Honor, honor doesn't, doesn't, mean doesn't mean worship. Oh dear. Let's be clear. Let's let let's just like, what's worship mean? What does worship mean? Somebody uh, you revere out of everything else, you just worship. Somebody who's somebody a, a creator to you, you know? Worship, worship. I'm gonna have to give Mr. Brown the same English lesson that I gave some Muslims last week. Worship comes from the word you do. Worship comes from the word we are skippe, which means to give due honor. So worship literally means to honor. That is literally what worship means. It means to honor someone. That's what worship means. So when Jesus says, and I want to correct myself because last week I made a mistake. So when Jesus says, honor me as you honor the Father, last week I said that the word honor there was doxa. I was wrong. Doesn't mean doxa. Doxa means glorify. The word is timusai. Timusai means to honor something according to its worth. What's this? There we go. So I've just been given by Brother Paperboy. This is what the word uh, timayo, sorry, means. Timayo means to estimate, to affix the value to, for the value of something belonging to oneself. That's what it means when it says honor. Yeah. To honor, to have in honor, to revere, to venerate. Now it's not King James. It's a, elect, it's a dictionary of English Greek words. Now, let's be clear. Jesus has just said that the honor you give to God, give to me. Venerate me like you venerate God. That's what he said, not follow. The word timao does not mean follow, it means honor. And again, that, that could be, you know, it could be going either way. No, well, you, you take it uh, literally. What does the Greek timao mean? You're, you're taking the word literally. Other Christians will take it. Can we find the Greek word for follow? Could you find the Greek word for follow? What does what does the word timiao mean? But then it doesn't say worship me. No. You can find you can find in the Bible where God directly says, I am I am God, worship me alone. You will find those verses where God the Father says it. Mr. Brown. You never find Mr. Brown. The son what does worship mean? Those words. What it's does worship mean? It's not really how, how now, Mr. Say. Brown is 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 on the ropes now and he's wobbling. Because what he's trying to say is that the word worship is no, he's on the ropes and he's wobbling. Bless him. Because he's not an expert. He's not an expert. He's not an expert. Mr. Brown, if you doubt what I'm saying, fact check me. The word worship comes from the word weothskipe and it means to give due honor. The word timiao means to affix or venerate according to something's worth. So, the way that you honor the gold watch that your grandfather, now deceased, gave you as a war hero is different from the way that you honor a watch that you win at the seaside on one of those 20 pence machines. The way that I honor Mr. Brown is different from the way that I would honor Moses. The way that I honor God is different from the way that I would honor any man. But Jesus demands the honor that you give to the Father who is God for himself. And it's very clear linguistically, you're simply wrong. Who, who is Jesus speaking to? Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees. Yes, he was speaking to his opponents. Okay. So he wasn't really telling for everybody else, no, it was because his followers were in there amongst them. 
Brother, you just have to accept that the Dawah team has lied to you. The scriptures teach that Jesus is God. I'm open, I'm open for correction. Yeah? But for me, I understand that verse differently. You understand it the way you understand it. What is the Greek word for honor? It's, a, it's saying, you know, um, so what, what version of the Bible? Wait, wait. I don't, I don't, what version of the Bible is that one? I don't want to get into a thing. Wait, wait, wait. What is... Is, is that... Because it might have a different to, No, it's totally irrelevant to the question about the Greek. The Greek uses a clear word, timiao. What does timiao mean? So if we go back... Uh, what? what? about Hebrew? What? What about Hebrew? What about in Hebrew? To honour. There you go. So not follow. You want... You want timiao. You... Greek. Yes, it says honour because that's the translation. Honour. Honor. It's a conjugation of the verb. We conjugate verbs in every language. So, so the fact is, we've just established it through two different people, both looking it up independently. It's the honor. Just no. One second. Now, have we, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown? The New Testament was written in Greek. Mr. Brown, this, this is... Mr. Brown, don't let him get off the topic, guys. Mr. Brown, your script... Uh, it doesn't want to listen, so I'm going to speak to everyone else. Mr. Brown is running through a script right now. He's running through a script. First part of the script, the word doesn't mean honour, it means follow. He got caught out on that. So then he said, sorry, here's the full script. Where does Jesus say, worship me as you worship God? So I show him a verse where Jesus says, honor him as you honor God. Then he said, oh, the way we honor God is by worshiping and following his prophets. So then I said, Jesus has just said, follow his prophets and worship him. Then he says, no, Jesus meant follow me. Then we went through the Greek and I showed that the Greek meant honor. Then he tried to argue it meant follow, and then we established it meant great honour through two different people looking it up independently from one another. And now he says, now the next part of his script is, well, what would it say in Hebrew? The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Brown, like everyone in the Dawah team, is just following a script. Now, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, what language was the New Testament written in? He doesn't know. Greek. So why is he asking about what it would say in Hebrew? No, wrong again. What language did Jesus speak? Which is a dialect of Hebrew. So, there's nothing wrong with that. We have no... No, we don't. If we take one book, if we could take this book hypothetically, translate it into French, would you get the complete understanding of it? You so let me just deal with the fallacy. You've got to miss some of the Mr. Brown, let me deal with the fallacy. Let me deal with the fallacy. Some of the understanding that the English give. Mr. Brown, let me deal with the fallacy. the same concept in France. Let, yeah. Mr. Brown, let me deal with the fallacy. Mr. Brown, no, Mr. Brown, let me deal with the fallacy. I think we're going to have to end it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just deal with this fallacy, though. Because Mr. Brown is saying, what would it say in Aramaic? Well, simple. If we translated the Greek New Testament into Aramaic, we would find the equivalent Aramaic word that said the same as Timiao, and that is what it would say in Aramaic. The fact of the matter is the New Testament was written in Greek. Muslims don't like that because it proves what Christians say, not what Muslims want the New Testament to say. But now we've established that the Muslim script that Mr. Brown listens to is bankrupt. It's intellectually bankrupt. And that's why the Dawah team run away week in, week out. Have a good day, Mr. Brown. That's what Mr. Uh, what was it? Mr. Bob the Builder thinks. You know, that's what he's assuming, because that's from his perspective. Everybody's looking from their own perspective and angles. Yeah? But what I'm saying is, if you can go to Greek, you can go back to the original source. The source from the mouth itself. So what would he have said it? That's what I'm saying. Like the Syriac for Arabic language. Yeah, so, it, so we'll have to Hold on. The, Hold on. Now let's just apply, now let's just apply Mr. Brown's logic to his own Quran. Because the fact of the matter is, the Quran was written in a very unevolved, very underdeveloped form. It is a substrate 
an offshoot of the Syriac language. Now he says that when I quote the Greek New Testament in Greek, that I have to back translate it Desdire Erasmus fashion to the Aramaic. Well, there are many words in the Kufic Arabic that are not clear, that if you back translate it into the Syriac, say something very different from the later evolved Arabic script that Muslims find in their Quran today. So it's important that the Dawah team and Mr. Brown are consistent because if you back translate the verses connected to the seven virgins for martyrs using the Syriac substrate, the virgins become raisins. And it's a big difference whether a martyr is going to get seven virgins to shag eternally or seven raisins to eat. We must have been oblivious virgins anyway. This is what you interpret it. So the Quran doesn't say that? It's your understanding. Like I said... The Quran doesn't teach eternal virgins in heaven. Which, by the way, must be awful for the women. Just saying. That's got to be awful for the women. Uh, you get a little translation, you assume it says what it says, yeah? Now, if you speak to an actual person who understands Quran language, they can explain it better for you, yeah? Now, you mean like I these guys? It, as I was brought up, I, as I understand like these guys. it, in my mind, we don't see it as virgins. Is what we what you said is is uh, grapes, wines, yeah. So it's definitely different, it's seven different rivers flowing of different wines, without the without the negative effect that you get from Earth, basically. That's how mm, I right. understand it. Mr. Brown, again and again and again. First you're quoting, I'm Mr. Not Brown, sure. again and again and again. I'm not an expert in the Arabic. I've been taught a little bit, and I'm still a student. Mr. So what Brown, going to tell me, uh, Mr. Brown. Says? It's, it's alien to me. Mr. Brown, again That's and again and again, again and again and again, demands that I go to people who are experts in the Arabic language. It's, it's Ladies and gentlemen, I am quoting a book translated by experts in the Arabic language from Medina who are Muslims. But when their translation embarrasses Mr. Brown, he wants to chuck their translation under the bus. He says to me, go to experts in the language. So I do. I go to Dr. Muhammad uh, Al Adin Al Hilali. I go to Dr. Muhammad Ducha Khan. I can't actually read it, the, the writing's been rubbed off. But then when I read the verse that these linguist scholars from Medina University quote that says that the sun sits in a puddle of muddy water, the man who told me to go to the experts suddenly says the experts got it wrong because he knows that the Arabic say something different. So who should I go to? The expert that is Mr. Brown or the experts trusted to translate the Quran into English? These guys do. These guys do. Do you speak Arabic? Do you speak Arabic? Fluently? Yes. You're a linguist? I speak Arabic. You could translate the Quran into English? Don't take my point. Do you speak Arabic? Can you translate the Quran into English? you understand, learn the Arabic. Can you trans... I don't believe... So, the Muslim says to me, learn Arabic. I don't believe in Arabization. He believes in Arabization. He believes in Arabization. These colonial minds of the Muslims who have been dominated by the Arabs for centuries believe that God can only speak in Arabic. That's why they take Arabic names, bow down to an Arabic city, worship in an Arabic way, copy an Arabic man. One second, one second. We Christians have a better religion. God can speak in any language and no ethnicity is greater than another. The English is not greater than the Arab and the Arab is not greater than the English. But these Arabized minds of the Muslims believe that you have to learn Arabic to learn what God says because Allah isn't bilingual, which makes me better than Allah 
because I am bilingual. I, am. I can I am. speak yes, to. So you're better no, than no, Allah. No, no, no. Any bilingual human being is better than Allah because Allah can't communicate in English. All you English people, you have to learn Arabic to know what God is saying, which begs the question, why do Muslims bother translating it at all? If it's the case we have to learn the Arabic, why bother translating why it? But two linguists, two linguists do translate the Arabic into English. And when I trust what the linguists say, as, according, as opposed to the amateurs, and the amateurs here, and the non-linguists who walked away, and it embarrasses them, they chuck their scholars under the bus. They chuck their linguists under the bus. It's preaching, that's church. So, oh, my friend, it's biggest gun in that church. Don't preach. Can I ask you a question, Bob? Of course, you can. Yes. What's the question? Common thing. I it's think I heard common. this kind of question coming from this genius. Yeah. I think the question was yeah. when you, you read the Arabic, is there Welsh in it? No, no, that was the question. Scottish. When you read the Arabic, is there Scottish in it? Hold on a minute. Look after yourself. Nice speaking to you as always, Mr. Brown. Email me. Let's talk over Skype. Look, rather than having a discussion, your religion is better, my religion, my religion is better, your religion, let's have a fruitful discussion. Amen. Totally. Let's do that. Let's. Let's find out the Email me, BTB. Let's find out the yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's, work in let's do that. We have a common enemy. Good, let's yeah? do that. We have a common enemy. We've seen one of them. Let's, let's study more. our faith. There's more. And there's one that nobody talks about. It's the paedophilia movement. Nobody's talking yeah, about yeah. satanic and pe While we are let's talk about amongst it. each other, the satanic, the pagans, yeah, they're, they're, they're moving in, they're sweeping in. These assholes got us all wearing masks right now, right? And I don't even believe in the masks. That mask, the, the, the blue mask you're wearing is made in China and India and it's made by children. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, let's talk. Email me, btbsoko at gmail.com and let's talk on Skype. So, no, no, I'm just going to address the earlier point. So the, the cognitive dissonant person said, when you read the Arabic, is there Scottish in it? That's what he said. This is how unthinking the Muslims are when you challenge their religion. They come out with nonsensical points. But hold on, because one of the chapters of the Quran is called the mountain. But the word that is used for mountain in the Quran isn't the Arabic word for mountain. It's the Syriac word for mountain. So the Muslim brother would have better asked the question, when you read the Arabic, can you find Syriac in it? And the answer is, yes, you can. But what does that mean? It means that the Quran is in error when it says that this Quran is in pure Arabic. Because why are Syriac words in a pure Arabic Quran. The Quran is wrong again and again and again and again because it is not from God, it is not from Allah, its prophet was not speaking to God. Okay, guys, I'm going to take a break. I will be back and we'll talk some more. Have a good day.